for everyone for being here. Okay, uh, continue. All right. Um, thank you everyone for being here. Let me put my timer on so I don't overstay my welcome. Um, okay, so um, money, this talk is about money as an institutional blend. Um, money is perhaps the most enigmatic social uh, structure. It scares and perplexes us. At one moment it engenders security and protection by its value. At another, it elicits worry and fear at its loss of value. It a money deflates, it inflates and stabilizes. It is liquid moving from hand to hand, so to speak. It is illiquid being tied up in assets we cannot sell. Money makes the modern world go round by facilitating exchange, discharging debt, storing value and keeping score. And that said, it's one of the more, and as I'm interested very much in uh, how human beings create and think about institutions and develop these institutions that they don't understand, they have a hard time tracking. Nevertheless, uh, we find ways of coping with it. And so what I want to do is talk about the symbolic uh, system of money, modern money, particularly sovereign money uh, in this. And uh, here's the agenda. So I'll begin to talk briefly about the barter myth and its connection to what I call the user-based perspective on money. And this follows up with the first blending analysis, which is based on uh, Mark Turner and Geoff Kanye and Mark Turner's work in The Way We Think, which I think offers a good first account of this user-based perspective. But then I proceed to uh, offer an institutional blending analysis that comes from the issuer's perspective. And this perspective is hard for people to believe um, let alone think about, and thus it's quite rhetorically tricky. And then I want to end with uh, uh, one attempt, showing one attempt about four years ago uh, of an attempt to explain sovereign money operations uh, by thinking of it as a bartender would think about it. Um, and so finding more inventive ways of thinking about the hard to understand or fathom uh, aspects of money. So, um, so we all know where money came from, right? All one needs to do is consult chapter four of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations to learn that money was created as a solution to an a pre-existing problem of the double coincidence of wants. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but just that, you know, but when the division of labor first began to take place, this power of exchange must have frequently been very much clogged and embarrassed in its operations. We saw suppose, et cetera, et cetera, uh, someone has more of a commodity than he himself has occasion for while the other has less, etc. But if the latter should chance to have nothing that the former stands in need of, no exchange uh, can be made between them. So this idea here is this compelling account of the origins of money is that trade was not really possible. Barter is very inefficient and that it needed some way, some means of greasing and making the facility of exchange possible. Um, compelling though this notion uh, that money emerged directly from barter, it has very little evidence to show for it. Um, it seems to be an illogical deduction from an imaginary past. Uh, the force of the assumption is perhaps why Smith uses the uh, modal phrase must have been, uh, though it is not direct, there seems to be no other reasonable conclusion. Um, but in point of fact, the consensus among historians and anthropologists is that there is little evidence that it was the inefficiencies of barter that drove the widespread adoption of monetary technologies, right? So, but this money as a veil of barter is basically an enabling convention, in fact, in traditional economics themselves. Economists traditional econom economists uh, don't like to deal with money, as strange as that may sound, uh, because money is a veil for barter. Um, but that doesn't really match up with the history, the institutional history of the monetary systems that we experience. Um, though, um, so what I wanna do first is talk about money in this user-based perspective from uh, conceptual blending theory. Uh, and conceptual blending theory offers a very flexible analytic framework for teasing out dimensions of 
meaning in money systems. And the fundamental insight, just a review of conceptual blending theory, is that human beings think, talk, and act by creating, maintaining, modifying, and combining distinct scenes and scenarios or portions thereof, and that thinking and speaking and acting operate according to different mental spaces, the, each of which forms a scenario or scene populated with elements such as roles and their values. So I can have a banker role and a value filled by Mr. George Bailey, right? And it can be have semantic and pragmatic framing such as mortgage and default and foreclosure, and pragmatic connections between elements in different mental spaces that consolidate the network, right? As often as not the network uh, uh, of some of the more commonplace input spaces uh, selectively project conceptual structure into a blended space, which forms uh, new, perhaps emergent uh, meaning, or in this case, an emergent logic, right? So, um, Though I said that barter may be a false friend when it comes to the historical origins of money, nonetheless, understanding the cognitive underpinnings of monetized relationship can start with the recognition that money as some sort of barter or trade is deeply entrenched and reliable guide for users of a currency. It is an, and, and I think Fauconia and Turner's analysis is a good place to begin uh, with this account of material anchors for economic operations that is in uh, the way we think. And so let us suppose, of course, we begin with this notion of trading or bartering, which we have this input space. Tom has something of intrinsic value to Dick, say a plow, but does Dick have something of comparable value to Tom, say salmon or cows, right? This uh, scenario operates just as Smith suggested, requiring the double coincidence of wants, permitting economic activity to occur only via the direct exchange of goods, right? But what if it were possible to take this implicit relative value of goods and services that we see in the scene of trading and apply some kind of standard unit of comparative measure to all the goods and services worthy of exchange? Suppose, for instance, that barters decide that one plow might be worth equal to two cows and 60 salmon, and whatever unit of measure adopted reflects these differential values. So you have this unit of measure, right, uh, that offers some effective procedure for comparing tradable goods. Now, the, of course, as Connie and Turner point out, the domain of tradable goods and services is vast and impossible to track accurately in real time. So enter, if we have some kind of symbolic token, in this uh, uh, scenario, we have a durable good, uh, material elements of various stripes can serve as prompts for value exchange. The precise material of the tokens does not really matter so long as they are durable, portable, and capable of being denominated, right? Uh, so water, for instance, and other perishable items are not good, uh, do not make good currencies, right? They're very valuable, but they're not good currencies, right? Uh, precious metals are particularly good because they're soft and they don't oxidize and they can be denominated and transported, right? So in this scenario, some arbitrary or conventional but durable object can be mapped onto the value, right? And for money uh, to arise as a material viable means of exchange, the two input spaces of barter or trade and unit of measures connect uh, with the chosen token input, uh, where this becomes a symbol for the trustworthy assessment of value of any good. And so the blended space of money combines goods from one scenario, units of measure from another, material objects still potentially from another space, and maps goods uh, and a unit of measure into the money blend. And what's interesting from Fukani and Turner's perspective is that the participants no longer need to, cheat, uh, to track the complex outer space um, relations between inputs, right? By fixing solely on the dem uh, denominated tokens, market participants can assess the relative value of any given commodity at any given time. So one, they would say you live in the blend, right? In this token-based material anchored blend rather than the whole network. And you can exchange goods and service irrespective of the rhythms of their own productive capacities. So long as they have access to the tokens uh, and so long as every Tom, Dick and Harry trusts and accepts them as a means of exchange. So this is a, a general 
analysis that is inspired. It's not exactly Connie and Turner's analysis, but it, it's very close, I think. And it represents generally a sense in which this is the first pass of how people typically conceptualize money in their daily lives. And in fact, it's absolutely crucial. Uh, we couldn't get through the day, many of our days, especially in advanced uh, economies like ours, monetized economies, without it. Now, their end of their analysis, they make this fairly provocative quip. Uh, they say, in retrospect, when we start to think about the culturally mature network of money, we may be amazed that anyone ever swallowed it. Okay. Um, this uh, party shot. Uh, closely resembles what the economist Hyman Minsky uh, famously says, that anyone create money can create money. The problem is getting it accepted, right? And Minsky himself was a uh, heterodox macroeconomist who, in contrast to neoclassical counterparts, but in keeping with the tradition of John Maynard Keynes, always kept money front and center in the modeling of, of economies, particularly capitalist economies. So... Um, so then, the, so this is a big question behind uh, the thinking about the more, uh, the less apparent ways in which monetary systems run, and um, we should say that that this this view of money, uh, who, how could we, if we take a purely barter point of view, um, this is often now some economists call this the dupe some dope theory of monetary exchange. That is, I use currency X because I think Joe Schmo, a slightly more gullible person than me, will accept it, right? Um, but such, uh, but if we actually think about money as credit, debt uh, as a dialectic between debtors and creditors, and not just people of, of exchange, uh, then. This P.T. Barnum scenario is rarely of significance in the history of money. Money as a store of value and unit of analysis um, are much more important, and they are, uh, at least historically, creatures of states. And so uh, with that, I want to talk about, so let's talk about money. If we want a broader system of understanding money as a social system, there's really five main functions. It's a unit of account, it's a store of value, it's a method of payment, it's a medium of exchange, and it's a form of social storekeeping, okay? Um, when we think about it from here, functions one through three, at least in many histories of money or what we understand, are primary in the development of sovereign money systems, where functions four and five are, are much more, are, are what we would call derivative. They're derivative, but that doesn't mean they're not significant or they can't have um, very uh, important political and economic consequences. For instance, Hungarian citizens might like to have assets denominated in euros rather than flor florins, uh, and that might position themselves socially as wealthier than somebody else. So it could be a form of, of uh, social scorekeeping, right? So the, you know, they're not incidental, but when we think about money as a sovereign system, it's these three that are very important. And what I mean by method of payment is discharging debts, okay? So let's move on to the second part. So let's talk about sovereign monetary institutions. And we have to think of uh, something as blending is not just something that people do in their heads, which they do, or we do, kind of, but, but that we're, that it's much more socially distributed. It's institutional in a way. And some of it's very hard to keep in our heads um, and it's hard to believe, but nevertheless we behave or in the macro we behave this way. So we have to have some account for it, right? Um, and the first thing, as I said, is, so let's talk about a, um, a different blending analysis. Uh, that begins with the store of value and unit of, of accounts as, as important, particularly the notion of credit, right? Money is credits and debits. debits. So the first scenario, let's see the first scenario is that of credit and we'll call it credit money. Consider the fact that human beings, even denizens of large metropoli, dwell in relatively intimate communities of friends and family members. 
Human beings arrange their communities around the transactional roles of creditor and debtor. It's a dialectic of creditor and debtor. And such a scheme seems to be culturally widespread, if not universal. There's been lots of studies, both in anthropologists and histories, of the ways in which credit, this notion of being a creditor and a debtor, debtor is uh, ways of facilitating the various projects in most societies. So most societies, however small, operate according to a system of credits and debits. Money is credit in input space one signifies the type of interactive scenarios of improvised credit systems used to provide human endeavors. Credit is a preferred starting place rather than trade because one, it points to an endogenous social operation of all known cultures or most known cultures, whereas cultures vary widely in the, the extent to which they trade and barter, right? Uh, between uh, trading and bartering is really something that you do at least anthropologically, between polities, not within them. And two, it provides a plausible psychological basis for our propensity to seek and save credit, a hedge against uncertainty, that is the store of value. Um, this red point is that currency is used, I'm smuggling in the Falconian and Turner analysis here, because the idea is once you have credit, you have some means that if that functions according to a unit of account, um, you have a means of assessing goods and, and units of measure in terms of uh, some kind of exchange, but um, that's sort of smuggled into the analysis here. Uh, but the second, of course, is sovereignty. So one of the other things we, we that generally the history of monetary systems suggest, and I should say that this goes back about 4,000 years. So when I'm talking about modern money, I'm talking about something that grew up around the development of writing systems. So we're talking about between four and 5,000 years, particularly the earliest traces we have of this is in Mesopotamia. Um, in this case, uh, and one thing we know is, or one thing that seems to be the case is that the sovereign government, G, and I'm saying sovereignty here uh, in its broadest term, any, any institution, be it a single person or a set of institutions that has some kind of overarching authority, right? The issuer of the currency then, they are the ones that have established and enforced monetary standards and units of measure, right? So it's an actual something that the, so what we have in the history of these things are sovereigns that uh, enforce these standards and units of measure. Now, so here's what we have, I call this base money or sovereign money. So, um, this, uh, the sovereign government determines what kind of community-wide scorekeeping system is to be used. This is in the sovereignty scenario of, of the viewpoint of the uh, establishing of monetary standards, which I should also say um, piggyback on standards of weight and measure, particularly weight. Uh, the names of, of, of currencies often are units of weight, not exclusively, but they do. So the scenario in this input space too is something like a rule book. It specifies what entities can issue money. Um, it essentially, it is essentially recognized the deontic power, the monopoly on violence or something that serves as the basis of sovereignty and the basis of money. And that in the base money blend, essentially what money is, is basically debt and credit. It's a record of debts. That is those that are owed by the sovereign government or owed to the sovereign government. So the sovereign government holds a monopoly on the creation of money because what they hold is the standard of measure. And then they hold, uh, oftentimes they co-opt the means of production of the commodity if such a commodity serves. Now, what this means is um, there's this strange logic that develops in this blended conceit. When we think of money this way, um, when we think of money as a user, right, um, the user has to earn the money before, you know, I must earn the money before I can spend it, right, uh, or I have to borrow it, right, but I need to earn the money before I can spend it. The issuer of the currency, in contrast, must spend it before any possibility of receiving it back. The, the, the sovereign spends the money into existence, right? 
institutions, particularly treasuries, mints, central banks, control both sides of the ledger of being a creditor and debtor through the symbolic and power of numerical infinity. By creating and debiting accounts at will, right? Logically, this is kind of an inverse operation of what we would think of as our, no, our normal household notions of being, um, of working with money, right? We are households, economy, right? Oikos, um, um, you know, uh, local governments are of course in the United States are also households in this respect, but, but um, federal governments and national governments, sovereign currencies are not households. It's kind of like looking in the mirror and seeing the mirror image of your leg kick as you stand still because it has to spend it into existence. Now, the key problem of understanding money systems is how do they come to be accepted? So the dupe sum dope theory implicit in barter trade accounts uh, would have us believe that the systems rely on nothing more than a series of two person interactions. But this institutional blending account suggests that money is actually three entities a debtor, a creditor, and a bank, where bank is any unit of account institution chartered or otherwise developed by a sovereignty in its broad form, which controls both sides of the ledger, right? And also um, what makes us a debtor? Well, one of the things that makes you a debtor is often you owe something to a sovereign in the form of taxes, fines, fee, uh, fees, tithes, Etc. Here is a great example of when I talk about money as credit and sovereign money. Um, we can see this happening in medieval England with tally sticks. Tally sticks are these fascinating instruments that we had until the 19th century when they decided to burn all of the ones at the Exchequer and burn down Parliament too. Uh, these are essentially uh, hazelwood uh, sticks that are notched and ins with inscriptions that record the debt um, or cre and credit side and is split in two. So you have the creditor half as the stock and the debtor half as the stub or the foil. Now these were primarily used uh, by tax assessors to circulate the subject to indicate or calculate a subject's tax liability that is owed and maybe the local sheriff would, would then collect it. Now, per usual practice, once uh, you present them with whatever denomination is necessary to discharge your tax, your fines, your fees, uh, they take uh, the, the debtor holds the stub style, brings the stub to the exchequer or the sheriff. And then when you have discharged your debt, they match the stock stub to the stub and your debt is forgiven and redeemed, hence the religious overtones here. You're now good. You're now made whole. Um, but what was interesting is during the reign of Henry II, around 1154 to 1189, uh, the exchequer did a process of selling the stock portion of the tally, writing down what was on the stock portion in their own records at the exchequer, and selling the stock to anyone who would uh, buy it at slightly below the fair market value right, slightly less than their face value to the government, either through adding gold coins and other things or provisioning of some kind. And then the bearers of which then can use that stock end to settle their own tax liability, or in turn, what they turned out to do was to sell to other subjects as long as the subjects had faith in King Henry. So the medieval tally stick is money. It's basically, it's something, uh, a proto bond. Its bearers possess credit backed by the highest authority, which manifests the unit of account. As such, it stores value for the bearer, and as such can be circulated among other subjects as a mean, means of payment, discharging their own debts, or as exchange, right? Tom could receive the stock end of the tally stick as payment for a plow or something, even if the stock end had been circulating for years, as long as it can serve to discharge the debts to the ministry of the exchequer, right? So this is some, an example of credit money, of kind of sovereign money that is in fact what we have today. Now, with that, there's some really interesting logics that develop about how monetary systems operate. Um, so 
as a sole manufacturer of the currency, the sovereign government can create money without limit. That is, the sovereign government is not financially constrained numerically, right? Um, this is especially true now when 97% uh, of, of money is digital entries on spreadsheets. Um, a sovereign government can buy anything for sale that is for sale in its own currency. This is where we get the difference between strong currencies and weaker currencies, developing currencies. The United States dollar is a world reserve currency and about 70 to 8, 75% of all things for sale in the world can be bought with dollars. Uh, Hungarian forints uh, are not nearly as powerful, right? You can't buy, and in Zimbabwe dollars or other weaker currencies of developing countries, they have problems because they can't provision food and energy. And so they have to import inflation, right? They, they, their currencies are quite weak. It's a big problem, right? Um, the sovereign government, especially with a non-convertible currency, can never go bankrupt involuntarily. Uh, they can voluntarily default on things. And they, uh, I know Russia did in the early 90s uh, because they didn't want to give up their currency reserves of dollars and other, other uh, currencies. Uh, but if you have a sovereign currency, uh, you can't go bankrupt in any uh, the way in which a household can. Um, a sovereign government often allows private banks to create their own credit money. Basically, what a bank is, is a license to create credit. Um, unlike what is commonly assumed when you look into the weeds of how commercial banks operate, is they are not money warehouses, they are money factories. The details are interesting, but a bit obtuse. A sovereign government places its users in, users in debt by levying of taxes, fees, fines, and tithes. So this is the basis of acceptance. Taxes drive currencies. They, they drive the currency because most of the people need the currency to discharge their debt. So they're going to use it generally because the sovereign only accepts their own denomination, right? If you look at the five pound note in uh, the queen promises to uh, pay the bearer of this note the sum of five pounds, right? And finally, a primary concern of sovereign government is inflation. That is the printing of money or the creation of money can be inflationary. And of course, this is, this is the big constraint. This is what people worry about, uh, inflation. They should also worry about deflation. That's a separate story. But inflation is certainly a primary concern of the overproduction of money. And that's where a lot of arguments among policymakers and, and economists now uh, think about when we talk about sovereign money systems. OK, so that's the emergent logic. And notice that this is not a logic that really comports easily with the way we habitually think about money in our own lives, right? Okay, and so, um, as I said, it's hard. In fact, people tend not to believe it, but if you ask economists, many economists who like Alan Greenspan or others of, of various stripes, they've testified to the fact that this is how it works, um, even though they pursue very different or have very different views about what government should or should not do, right? But it's very hard for us to, to wrap our minds around. So. I want to show you this a uh, little. Uh, this is from about four years, a little over four years ago when Donald Trump was just elected. So it's around 2017, he was just inaugurated. And here you have the Australian economist Stephen Keen and Lelda Smith, who runs what's known as the Capital Network. This is a financial uh, news organization out of Sydney, Australia. And is a pricey to understanding like Brexit and Donald Trump and other things. Uh, she wanted uh, Steve Keen to explain how money operates. And so the decision was to locate this bit in a bar named Papa Getty's, which is a, a voodoo themed bar, and to use the, the, the trade of mixology or bartending to explain money. So I'll play you this two minute clip. Starting with the basics, 
How do governments and money work? This at the moment is the economy. Now, mm -hmm. what I'm looking at, I'm not looking at the goods and services produced in the economy, like all the stuff behind us here at the bar. I'm looking at money. How does money turn up in the economy? What most people think is the government makes the money. So they think the government just pours a certain amount of money in, and if the government pours in too much, and we have a little, there we go, it's going the opposite and direction. And I'm sure the government has a much a, easier- A much easier system than that, okay? Tap than this one that goes <laughs> far more than a few drops. Yeah, okay. But it's dropping but away that's actually, then. That's actually a bit like what government are doing right now because they think they simply can't put too much money in there otherwise they'll run out and what do we have on the other side what we, then well we have don't worry i'm okay. holding on to the government here it's well, dribbling in a very slow space yeah and off. over here what's this here and you have the banks a skeleton's arm yeah well the, 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 what if the banks were quite happy to give you money as well but there's a condition they'll only give you money over here if they also pour equivalent amount of stuff Whoa. over here we have money coming in through here and we have debt exactly the same amount of debt as money is stored by the banks and then you owe them what's turned up over here. So we have a dribble of money coming in from the government. Most of the money in the economy is actually created by the banks. And what the banks do when they lend you money, which is what's happening over here, and now you're having a pile up of debt over here, hence the dead hand. Sure thing. So governments create by spending, banks create by creating debt. Well, I think we've got to turn these taps on before yeah. this debt explodes. That's uh the trouble, we haven't. <laughs> Okay, um, because the government, the government has decided in its own infinitely low level of wisdom, and this is where the politicians come in, they might call the politicians over here, you know, right? a bit of a dead skull. They believe the, the government can run out of money. Okay. Now, in fact, what the government has at the same time is called a central bank. The central bank has a limitless capacity to okay. add money up there. So there actually is no possibility of the government running out of money. But that's the belief <laughs> that we have. So they say we're going to run out of money. And if you say, what they say instead is we have to tax you. Okay, we're going to run out of money. If we don't tax, we won't have any money to spend. So, Steve, these are really the fundamental. Okay. So, everybody heard that, I assume. Starting with the... Okay. Um, so, this is an interesting presentation. Um, so, the idea is, so, economists tend to think in terms of stocks and flows. So, this, this idea, so we have an input space, I'll say, of mixology. And it's appropriately general. It, it fits with bartending in particular but also in conjunction with the Papa Getty's uh, voodoo theme, it's an apothecary. You can create potions and those potions can be, um, uh, can be a, a salve, they can help you or they can hurt you, right? In voodoo, certain voodoo traditions, right? So you have a, in this case, you have a pint glass, you have two absinthe fountains and you have liquid and we have wine glasses and water. And we also have then two input spaces, the sovereign money space and the bank credit space. And so the absinthe fountains are artifacts that are, are designed to map on and represent government processes, government institutions the, uh, of, uh, or, the bank, or the banking institutions. And the liquid, uh, the pint glass becomes the economy right, of in terms of the money in the, in the economy at any given time. And the liquid is liquid money, hence liquidity. Um, and of course, then banks create money in terms of credit money that becomes your debt, right? They deposit, uh, if they give you a loan, it, they create an account that then has money that you use, but you have to pay it back in, a, uh, in the form of uh, a uh, loan with additional interest, uh, other money you have, right? And the the government spends money into existence. They just did this uh, a few a month ago. They did this before with the Coats Act or with the CARES Act, right? Money was directly credited through the central bank to your institutions in the form of of money. Uh, some people got checks, et cetera, et cetera. But but this is how it works, right? So this is the monetary cocktail now. The important part for Keen is you have the sovereign anthrin absinthe fountain that dribbles money into the economy. And then you have the bank absinthe fountain that pours money into the economy and private debt fills up the economy potentially to overflowing. So the, the real function, what he's worried about, his this particular economist is worried about um, is Public debt is not really debt the way you think it is. 
it the real problem he says is private debt what happens if if there's less money coming in from the government side and in or in terms of wages or the share of gdp people are going to the credit markets for money right and so that's piling up and this is where you get financial according to him this is where you get financial crises because banks create credit but unlike governments they can't destroy the credit they create they put it into columns as as both a liability and an asset for them but if their assets don't pan out um they can they can be insolvent right because they don't have the destructive power of money uh, creation the originary power of money that a central bank does or a treasury does okay so and we see a lot of things like uh in that many blending theorists would would see that uh as i've done a frame by frame analysis using the artifacts and some of the gestures here i love this phrase don't worry i'm holding on to the government here it's dropping dripping along this is a nice example in which you're using the reference from the blend but you're referencing the artifact from the mixology and nobody you know it's funny at at one level of remove there's a kind of ironic stance here but we understand what it means and we move along and at the same time we have governments create by spending so you see a the dribble of of white liquid going in and banks create by creating debt and you see the dark liquid coming in and also here's where a references to the dead hand of debt and that's where the the voodoo theme comes in quite handy here to indicate the potential problem particularly of private debt right and that we have money coming through here and we have debt exactly the same amount of debt as money stored in the banks and you owe them what's turned up over here so here is a, a general sense of of trying to explain uh sovereign money systems in the modern age and the role of both sovereign money and bank money and this potential macroeconomic consequences. So I'm seeing uh I so I'd like to sum up what I've presented here so far. So money I think the history suggests and economists would likely argue at least certain economists that it radically alters social reality by endowing human beings with the status of creditor and debtor right it determines how individuals position themselves in relationship to one another which in turn changes our imaginings of the past and future so the symbolic store money is a store of value uh, often permits the taking from the future to satisfy the present right the very basis of debt and indebtedness right yet uh, when money becomes unmoored from its material form as in the case of systems of non-convert fiat systems of non-convertible currencies currencies not redeemable in gold or silver or any other commodity it is easy to elicit in its users a sense of worry or panic that all credit lacks credibility right there is a kind of fetishization of the organic materiality of money um and and there's historically good reasons for doing that commodity money was certainly with us since 800 BC in Lydia Greece um but the materiality of money hides from view view the actual institutional engineering of money systems a symbolic means of continuing a uh, continuous editing of interconnected ledgers ledgers that with the advent of computing and internet intensifies the creation and velocity of circulation of money right the story then of modern money is one of credit and debt come into they come to intervene intervent um i'm sorry innervate virtually all aspects of human social life requiring institutional roles and customs for managing them um and the story of money as a system of issuance is difficult for humans to keep firmly in mind let alone believe i think it was uh john kenneth galbraith who who said that um once you learn how money is created the mind reels right at how easy it is right the story of money and modernity is it once a story of bartering and saving of giving and receiving of hoarding and distancing and all of these things and money perplexes us because the mental spaces needed 
uh, to understand and follow the systemic operations are complex, contradictory, counterintuitive, counterintuitive to many of our lived experiences as users. We live in the blend described by Foucault and Turner. Um, only technocrats live in the sovereign money blend if they do, and oftentimes they only do for at certain periods of time. Uh, human symbolic evolution is difficult and irksome to study because human beings have developed a knack for creating highly complex systems, which no single human can implement, let alone understand, and that we often use day-to-day -day conceptions that are ready to hand, um, but they hide from view some of the real operations. Um, the issuer's perspective on money and economic policy is tricky, and it requires more inventive analogies to be persuasive or to, to use. And so it's something that people um, uh, often uh, um, find that they understand, but then see the sums and get quite uh, worried about it. Um, so anyway, that's what I have to say on money and thank you.